welcome back to my channel today i'm going to do like the first video in the series that i wanted to start um i've been hinting at it in the last couple of videos that i did but we're going to do the first one today so i wanted to start like a it's very similar to what bailey sarian does on youtube if you don't know who she is and she does like a murder mystery and makeup monday video every monday where she just sits and does a makeup and talks about a true crime story and um usually like serial killers and things like that which is something that um i am like really fascinated by i've watched like loads of documentaries on different serial killers and things me and my mom like love true crime <laughs> sit and watch like crime channel like all the time so but more what i'm interested in is like missing person cases um just because i don't know i think it's like the unknown like they've just gone nobody no trace that like, that's just wild to me that like someone can just disappear basically off the face of the earth so that's more what i wanted to base my series on rather than like serial codes and things like that so that's what i want to do so credit to bailey for the idea she's like one of my favorite youtubers of all time you've got to watch her videos like they're so funny um so yeah that's what we're going to do today so I'm just going to be sitting down basically every Monday and just talking about a new case that I've found. I've got a lot um, that I need to research, like I've already got names and things um, that I'm going to get the research behind already. Um, but if there's any that you want me to talk about that interests you, then just leave me a comment and I'll look it up and do a video on it. So instead of it being like a tutorial, I'm just going to put what I've used like in the description box because I'll be obviously talking about the story not what i'm doing on my face so if there's anything that you want to know that i've used it will be in the description at the end of the video so the first one that i wanted to do is not like technically a missing persons case but it is at the same time um it's something quite well known it's the malaysia flight mh370 that kind of just like vanished into thin air pretty much um so that's what we're going to talk about. I wanted to do one that was kind of like well known to start off with and then you know we'll get more into like the actual missing persons cases that I've been researching but this one I just wanted to do first because it's just crazy to me that like a whole plane of people <laughs> has just like gone. So yeah we're gonna talk about that one today. I've done um, a little bit of research so what I'm going to do is basically just sit and do my makeup and just read through what I've researched so Malaysia Airline Flight 370 is also known as MH370 um, or MAS370. It was a scheduled international um, passenger flight and it was operated obviously by Malaysia Airlines and it was going from Kuala Lumpur Airport to Beijing City International Airport. This was on the 8th of March 2014. The crew of the um, aircraft last communicated with um, air traffic control around 38 minutes after they took off when the flight was over the South China Sea. Um, the aircraft was lost from ATC radar screens minutes later but was tracked by a military radar um, for another hour. Um, heading westwards from its planned flight path um, and it was crossing the um, Malay Peninsula and the Adam Andaman Sea. There's going to be a lot of things in here that I can't pronounce so just bear with me. It left radar range 200 nautical miles which is about 370 kilometres northwest of Penang Island in northwestern peninsula Malaysia um, and it was scheduled fly early in the morning of 8th of March 2014 from Kuala Lumpur to Beijing. Um, it was one of the two daily flights operated by Malaysia Airlines so it's not like a one-off they do this like every day. It was traveling from Kuala Lumpur International Airport to Beijing City International Airport and it was scheduled to depart at 0035 Malaysian time and arrive at 6.30 in the morning Beijing time. Um, on board there were 227 passengers, 10 cabin crew, 2 pilots. There was 14,296 kilos of cargo which is about 31,517 pounds of cargo. The planned flight duration was 5 hours and 34 minutes, which would consume an estimated 37,200 kilos of jet fuel, which is about £82,000. Um, the aircraft carried £108,200 of fuel, including reserves, so this allowed for an endurance of like 7 hours and 31 minutes. 
um, the extra fuel was enough to divert the plane to alternate airports if needed, which were, here we go, this is pronunciation <laughs> test for me, Jinan Yaokwang, I don't know if that's right, International Airport, which would require £10,600 of fuel, or Hangzhou Chaoshan International Airport, which would require £23,600 of fuel to reach from Beijing. So they had lots of extra fuel um, in case they needed to go for another airport for any reason, like if there was a problem at Beijing, um, they had fuel on board to be able to get to a different airport. So at 0042 Malaysian time, um, flight 370 took off from runway 32R and was cleared by air traffic control to climb to flight level 180, which is approximately 18,000 feet. Voice analysis has determined that the first officer communicated with air traffic control whilst the flight was on the ground and that the captain communicated with air traffic control after the departure as well. Shortly after takeoff, the flight was transferred from the airport's air traffic control to Lumpar radar, which is air traffic control but on a different frequency. So this is what they would need to communicate with that like ongoing basically on this frequency that they got transferred to. The ATC over Peninsula Malaysia and adjacent waters is provided by the Kuala Lumpur Area Control Centre and Lumpur Radar is the name of the frequency that's used for en route air traffic. So people that are on the way to their destination, they will use that frequency to contact air traffic control if there's like any issues, any problems or basically just to tell them where they are. At 0046, the Lumpar radar cleared flight 370 to go to flight level 350, which is approximately 35,000 feet. And at 101 in the morning, flight 370's crew reported to Lumpar radar that they had reached flight level 350, which they confirmed again at 0108. The aircraft's final transmission was an automated position report sent using the aircraft communications addressing and reporting system protocol at 0106am. By the way, just a quick disclaimer, the eye look that I'm doing today is um, a recreation. I don't know if you can see there. So this is what we're attempting today. It's by Saskia Field and I'll put her Instagram in the description box below. So among the data provided in this message was the total fuel remaining, um, which was £96,600. So they had loads of fuel left. Um, the last verbal signal to air traffic control occurred at 0119 in the morning. Um, this is, I think, in Malaysian time, so the Malaysian time zone. Um, when the captain acknowledged a transition from Lumpur radar to Ho Chai Min Air Control Centre and it was, quote, so the Lumpur radar said, Malaysian 370 decimal 9, good night, and, end quote, and the pilot replied, quote, good night, Malaysian 370, end quote. The crew was expected to signal air traffic control in Ho Chai Min City um, when the aircraft passed into Vietnamese airspace just north of the point where contact was lost. The captain of another aircraft attempted to contact the flight crew of 370 um, shortly after 1.30 in the morning and that was using the international air distress frequency to relay the Vietnamese air traffic controls request for the crew to contact them. So I think they travelled into like Vietnamese air control um, and they wanted to confirm basically with the flight. Um, but they couldn't get through so another flight that was traveling in that direction tried to contact them on the emergency like distress frequency. The captain of the flight trying to contact the crew said he was able to establish communication but only heard quote mumbling and static end quote. Um, calls made to flight 370's cockpit at 0239 and 0713 were unanswered but they were acknowledged by the aircraft's satellite data unit. The pilot in command of M370 was 53-year-old Captain Zahari Ahmad Shah from Penang. Um, he joined Malaysia Airlines as a cadet pilot in 1981 and after training and receiving his commercial pilot's license he became a second officer with the airline in 1983. He was promoted to captain of Boeing 737-400 airliners in 1991, captain of Airbus A330-300 in 1996 and captain of Boeing 777-200 in 1998. 
um he had been a type rating instructor and a type rating examiner since 2007 and he had a total of 18,365 hours of flying experience so he knew what he was doing he's been flying planes for like no, 30 years. The co-pilot was a 27 year old first officer called Farouk Abdul Hamid. He joined Malaysia Airlines as a cadet pilot in 2007 after becoming a second officer of Boeing 737-400 airliners. Um, he was then promoted to first officer of, of Boeing 737-400 in 2010 and then transitioned to Airbus A330-300 in 2012. Um, in November 2013, he began training as a first officer of Boeing 777-200 aircraft. Uh, flight 370 was his final training flight, so he was scheduled to be examined on his next flight. He had accumulated 2,763 hours of flying experience. Of the 227 passengers, 153 of them were Chinese, including a group of 19 artists with six family members and four staff returning from a calligraphy exposition in uh, exhibition sorry of their work in Kuala Lumpur 38 passengers were Malaysian and the remaining passengers were from 12 different countries at 1:20 a.m. flight 370 was observed on radar at the Kuala Lumpur air control center as it passed the navigational waypoint in the gulf of thailand and five seconds later, the mode S symbol disappeared from the radar screens. And at 1.21, the flight itself disappeared from the radar screen completely and was lost at about the same time on the radar at Ho Chi Minh Control Center, which reported that the aircraft was at a nearby waypoint. So at 1.21, it just disappears basically into thin air off the radars. So air traffic control uses secondary radar, which relies on a signal emitted by a transponder, which is in every aircraft, but the transponder was no longer functioning on MH370 after 1.21 a.m. The final transponder data indicated that the aircraft was flying at its assigned cruise altitude at level 350, which was again about 35,000 feet, and was traveling at 471 knots, which is about 542 miles per hour true airspeed. There were not really any clouds in the sky, there was no rain or lightning nearby, so there was no reason why everything just kind of disappeared, there was no bad weather or anything like that. Um, later analysis estimated that Flight 370 had about £91,500 of fuel when it disappeared from the radar, so they still had so much fuel left, it's not like they just ran out of fuel and just like fell out of the sky, they just come off the radar for some reason and no one knows where they went. By the time the transponder stopped functioning, military radar showed Flight 370 ret turning right and then beginning a left turn to a southwesterly direction. Um, from 0130 in the morning to 0135, um, military radar showed Flight 370 at 35,700 feet with a ground speed of 571 miles per hour. Um, Flight 370 continued across the Malay Peninsula and it fluctuated between 31,000 and 33,000 feet in altitude. So it was kind of going like in between those two, um, which is a bit strange, I don't know why it was kind of going up and down like that. Civilian primary radar at Sultan Ismail Petra Airport. I'm really bad at pronouncing, I'm really sorry. With a 69 mile range, made four detections of an unidentified aircraft between 1.30 and 1.52. Um, the tracks of the unidentified aircraft are, quote, consistent with those of the military data, end quote. And at 1.52, Flight 370 was detected passing just south of the island of Penang. Um, from there, the aircraft flew across the Strait of Malacca, passing close to another waypoint, um, Pulau Perek at 0203 in the morning after which it flew along air route n571 to a couple of other waypoints so it was kind of like detected going a certain route but it's just come off like the radars and they can't get a hold of the captain or anyone in the aircraft to figure out what's going on the last known radar detection from a point near the limits of the Malaysian military radar was at 0222 and it was 12 miles after passing a waypoint which is 273 miles from Penang and 284.6 miles northwest of Penang airport and they 
um, recorded it was at, at an altitude of 29,500 feet. So it's gone down even further than before, um, but like they can't get a hold of anyone to figure out what's going on on the plane. So weird to me, like where are they going? Like what's happening? The countries involved were kind of reluctant to release information collected from military radar because of the sensitivity of revealing their capabilities so basically on other countries knowing what their radars could pick up in case there was like a war or anything like that they would know what their equipment could do and it would put them at a disadvantage so they were kind of reluctant to share that indonesia has an early warning radar system um, but its air traffic control radar did not register any aircraft with the transponder code that was used by mh370 despite the aircraft possibly having flown near or over the northern tip of sumatra which is in indonesia um, Indonesian military radar tracked MH370 earlier um, when en route to a waypoint before the transponder is thought to have been turned off but it did not provide any information on whether it was detected afterwards. I'm back, sorry I had to do that off camera because it was literally so hard to get the cut crease where I wanted it but I'm back. So Thailand and Vietnam also detected MH370 on radar before the transponder stopped working. The radar position symbols for the transponder code used by MH370 vanished after the transponder is thought to have been turned off. Um, the Vietnam Deputy Minister of Transport stated that Vietnam noticed MH370 turn back towards the west and Vietnam operators had informed Malaysian authorities twice the same day on the 8th of March. The Thai military radar detected um, an aircraft that might have been MH370 but it isn't known um, at what time the last radar contact was made and the signal did not include any identifying data. At 2.25 Malaysian time the aircraft satellite communication system sent a log on request um, message the first message since the transmission at 0107, which was relayed by satellite um, to a ground station, both operated by satellite commun telecommunications company in Marsat. After logging onto the network, the satellite data unit aboard the aircraft responded to hourly status requests from in Marsat and two ground to aircraft telephone calls at 0239 and 0713, which were unanswered by the cockpit. I'm not sure why there's such a big gap between those phone calls though. Like I couldn't see any reason why they waited five hours to ring it just seems very odd to me but anyway the final status request and aircraft acknowledgement occurred at 0810 about one hour and 40 minutes after mh370 was scheduled to land at beijing the aircraft sent a log on request at 0819 which was followed after a response from the ground station by a log on acknowledgement message at 0819. The log on acknowledgement is the last piece of data available from flight 370. The aircraft did not respond to a status request from Inmosa at 9.15. Um, at 0138 Malaysian time, Ho Chi, Ho Chi Minh Area Control Centre contacted Kuala Lumpur Area Control Centre to query the whereabouts of Flight 370 and informed them that they had not established verbal communication with Flight 370. The two centres exchanged formal calls during the next 20 minutes um, but there was no new information. At 0203, Kuala Lumpur Air Control Centre replied to Ho Chai Min ACC information received from Malaysian Airlines Operations Centre that Flight 370 was apparently in Cambodian airspace. Ho Chai Min um, ACC contacted Kuala Lumpur ACC twice in the following eight minutes asking for confirmation that Flight 370 was in Cambodian airspace. At 2.15, the watch supervisor at Kuala Lumpur ACC queried Malaysia Airlines operation centre which said that it could exchange signals with MH370 and that it was in Cambodian airspace. So Kuala Lumpur Area Control Centre contacted Ho Chai Min to ask whether the planned flight path for 370 had passed through Cambodian airspace. Um, they said that no, it wasn't supposed to enter Cambodian airspace and that they had already contacted um, Phnom Penh Area Control Centre which controls Cambodian airspace. Um, and they had no communication with Flight 370. So they couldn't figure out why the plane was going through Cambodian airspace. Um, 
because that wasn't on the flight plan so they were a bit confused so Kuala Lumpur um, ACC contacted um, Malaysia Airlines Operation Centre at 0234 inquiring about the communication status with MH370 and they were informed that it was in a normal condition based on signal download apparently Later, there was another Malaysia Airlines aircraft, which was flight 386 bound for Shanghai. Um, they attempted at the request of Ho Chi Minh ACC to contact flight 370 on the Lumpur radar frequency, which was the frequency that the flight 370 had last communicated with Malaysian air traffic control and on emergency frequencies as well. But the attempt was unsuccessful, so they didn't hear anything from the flight on either frequency. At 3.30, Malaysia Airlines Operation Centre informed Kuala Lumpur ACC that the locations it provided earlier were, quote, based on flight projection and not reliable for aircraft positioning, end quote. Um, over the next hour, Kuala Lumpur ACC had contacted Ho Chi Minh ACC asking whether they had signaled Chinese air traffic control. At 5.09 in the morning, Singapore ACC was queried for information um, regarding Flight 370. Um, at 5.20, an undisclosed official contacted Kuala Lumpur ACC requesting information about Flight 370 and he said, based on known information, quote, MH370 never left Malaysian airspace, end quote. Malaysia Airlines um, issued a media statement at 7.24 Malaysian time, one hour after the scheduled arrival time of, of MH370 at Beijing. So an hour after it was supposed to arrive at Beijing, they did a statement um, basically saying that they don't know where the plane is. They said that the communication had been lost um, by Malaysian air traffic control at 2.40 a.m. and the government had initiated a search and rescue operation. The time the contact was lost was later corrected to 1.21 a.m. So it was like an hour and 10 minutes difference to what they said originally. Neither the crew nor the um, aircraft communication systems relayed any stress signals, um, any indication of bad weather or technical problems. They kind of just like literally vanished. Like they didn't give any clues that there was something wrong with the plane. They had loads of fuel left. So, you know, they weren't like in danger of running out of fuel. On the 24th of March, the Malaysian Prime Minister appeared before media at 2200 local time, so 10 p.m., um, to give a statement regarding Flight 370, during which he announced that he had been briefed by the Air Accidents Investigation Branch and that it and Inmosat, the satellite data provider, had concluded that the airline's last position before it disappeared was in the southern Indian Ocean. Um, as there were no places where it could have landed, they basically must have they basically thought that it must have just crashed into the sea. Just before he spoke at 2200 Malaysian time, an emergency meeting was called in Beijing for relatives of the flight uh, 370 passengers. Um, Malaysia Airlines announced that flight 370 was assumed lost with no survivors. Um, it was notified to most of the families in person or via telephone call, but some received a text that it was likely that the aircraft had crashed with no survivors. Can you imagine just getting a text like, oh yeah, sorry, the plane crashed and everyone's dead. Like a text, that seems just so like, I don't know, it just seems like they don't really care. The search for the missing plane became the most expensive in aviation history, um, focused initially in the South China Sea and Andaman Sea, before analysis of the aircraft's automated communications with an Inmasat satellite indicated a possible crash site somewhere in the Southern Indian Ocean. I'm going to do this eye look off camera because it's taken me literally forever and I'll finish the story before I even get to my base so <laughs> I'm just going to do this and then I'll come back and do the rest of my makeup while I finish the story. Okay I'm back. That was taking too long <laughs> for me to do so I just did it off camera. So the search for the missing plane became the most expensive in aviation history. Um, focused initially on the South China Sea and the Andaman Sea before analysis of the aircraft's automated communications with an Intermasat satellite, that's so hard to say, indicated that um, a possible crash site somewhere in the southern Indian Ocean. 
The lack of official information in the days immediately after the disappearance prompted fierce criticism from the Chinese public, um, particularly from relatives of the passengers, um, as most people on board Flight 370 were of Chinese origin. Several pieces of marine debris confirmed to be from the aircraft washed ashore in the Western Indian Ocean during 2015 and 2016. After a three year search across 46,000 square miles of ocean, um, failed to relocate the aircraft. The Joint Agency Coordination Centre heading the operation suspended their activities in January 2017. A second search was launched January 2018 um, by a private contractor, Ocean Infinity, but they also ended without success after six months. Relying mostly on analysis of data from the Inmasat satellite, which the aircraft last communicated, the Australian Transport Safety Bureau proposed initially um, that a hypoxia event might have been the cause. So this is where a slow or gradual decompression occurs slowly enough to go unnoticed and might only be detected by instruments. Um, the type of decompression may also come about from a failure to pressurise as an aircraft climbs to altitude, eventually causing loss of consciousness. So they thought this might have been the reason why they couldn't get a hold of anybody on the on the plane um, and it might have been a reason why the plane just kind of disappeared or they thought they might have crashed into the sea and that would have been the reason why there was no distress signal or anything sent. At various stages of the investigation, um, possible hijacking scenarios were considered, including crew involvement. Um, there were two men that boarded flight MH370 with stolen passports, um, which raised suspicions in the immediate aftermath um, of its disappearance. The passports, one was Austrian and one was Italian. They'd both been reported um, stolen from Thailand within the preceding two years. Interpol stated that both passports were listed on its stolen and lost travel document database um, and that no check had been made against the database since the passports were first reported as stolen. Malaysia's Home Minister criticised his country's immigration officials for failing to stop the passengers travelling with the stolen European passports. The two one-way tickets purchased from the holders of the stolen passports. They were booked through China Southern Airlines. It was reported that an Iranian man had um, ordered the cheapest tickets to Europe by a telephone in Bangkok, Thailand, and had paid by cash. The two passengers were later identified as Iranian men, one aged 19 and one aged 29, and they had entered Malaysia on the 28th of February using valid Iranian passports. Um, the two men were believed to be asylum seekers. I don't know where they got this information from, it doesn't say. I don't know if this is just like a theory that they're coming up with um, due to them being from Iran. I don't know, but there's no other information that says that they're asylum seekers, so I don't know. The Secretary General of Interpol stated that the organisation, quote, inclined to conclude that it was not a terrorist incident, end quote. So I didn't think it was anything to do with um, a terror group or anything like that. United States and Malaysian officials reviewed the backgrounds of every passenger named on the manifest. On the 18th of March 2014, the Chinese government announced that it had checked um, all of the Chinese citizens that were on board and had ruled out the possibility that there were any involved in, quote, destruction or terror attacks, end quote. One passenger who worked as a flight engineer for a Swiss jet charter company was briefly under suspicion as a potential hijacker because he was thought to have the relevant aviation skills. US officials believe most likely explanation would be that someone in the cockpit of the flight reprogrammed the aircraft's autopilot to travel across the South Indian Ocean. Police searched the homes of the pilots and seized financial records of all 12 crew members, including bank statements, credit cards, um, bills and mortgage documents. On the 2nd of April 2014, the Malaysian Police Inspector General at the time said more than 170 interviews have been conducted as part of the investigation, um, including interviews with the family of the crew and pilots. Media reports claimed that um, Malaysian police had identified Captain Zahari as the prime suspect um, if human intervention was eventually proven to be the cause of 
um, the flight's disappearance. The United States FBI reconstructed the deleted data from Captain Zahari's home flight simulator. A Malaysian government spokesperson indicated that, quote, nothing sinister had been found, end quote. The preliminary report issued by Malaysia in March 2015 stated that there was, quote, no evidence of recent or imminent significant financial transactions carried out, end quote, by any of the pilots or crew. And that analysis of the behaviour of the pilots on CCTV showed, quote, no significant behavioural changes, end quote. So they were trying to say that they didn't think it was anything to do with the pilots. There was no evidence that they were in money trouble there was no like change in their behavior that they could see from cctv so they just didn't think it was them in 2016 a leaked american document stated that a route on the pilot's home flight simulator um which closely matched the projected flight over the indian ocean um was found during the fbi analysis of the flight simulator's computer hard drive so basically they were saying that the pilot had done at home flight simulator and it was like a very similar path to what they think had happened to flight 370 which is a bit suspicious. This was later confirmed by the ATSB although the agency stressed that this did not prove the pilot's involvement. The find was similarly confirmed by the Malaysian government so they were saying that even though he had this flight simulator and he did like basically the same path as to what they think happened with the plane, they don't think he actually did anything wrong and it was just a coincidence. In 2018, the sister of the pilot said that the safety investigation report on MH370 showed, quote, nothing negative, end quote, about the pilot flying the plan. According to the report, quote, there were seven manually programmed waypoint coordinates that when connected together will create a flight plan from KLIA to an area south of the Indian Ocean. KLIA is Kuala Lumpur International Airport, south of the Indian Ocean through the Andaman Sea. But a forensic report concluded that there were no unusual activities other than game related flight simulations, end quote. Hmm. They were dated the 3rd of February 2014. Um, but they could have originated from different files so they don't know if he actually did that simulation on that date or if it was earlier or you know because they can change basically the time it comes up I think. The Malaysian Ministry of Transport's final report from July 2018 was inconclusive but highlighted um, Malaysian air traffic controllers failures to attempt to communicate with the aircraft shortly after its disappearance. In the absence of a definitive cause of disappearance, um, air transport industry safety recommendations and regulations citing Flight 370 have been intended mostly to prevent a, re a repetition of um, the circumstances associated with the loss. So they're basically trying to not have anything like this happen again. These include increased battery life on underwater locator beacons, lengthening of recording times on flight data recorders and cockpit voice recorders, and new standards of aircraft position reporting over the open ocean. With all 227 passengers and 12 crew aboard presumed dead, the disappearance of Flight 370 was the deadliest incident involving a Boeing 777 and the deadliest in Malaysia history until it was surpassed in both regards by Malaysia Airlines Flight 17, but it had the best of luck evidently, which was shot down whilst flying over conflict-stricken eastern Ukraine four months later. So this was like the biggest thing up until four months later when there was unfortunately another sad tragedy. Public communication from Malaysian officials regarding the loss of the flight was initially met with confusion. The Malaysian government and the airline released like incomplete, imprecise and sometimes inaccurate information with civilian officials sometimes contradicting military officials. So there was kind of like mixed information going on. Sort of one person was saying one thing and then someone else was saying another thing. So people were kind of like, well, what's the truth? Malaysian officials were criticised for such persistent release of contradictory information, most notably regarding the last location and time of contact with the aircraft. Um, Malaysia's acting transport minister Hishamuddin Hussein, who was also the country's defence minister until May 2018, 
Um, he denied the existence of problems between the participating countries, but academics explained that because of regional conflicts, there were genuine trust issues involved in a cooperation and sharing intelligence and that these were hampering the search. So they were basically saying that these countries weren't talking to each other because they didn't want the other countries knowing what information they had. Criticism was also levelled at the delay of the search efforts. On the 11th of March 2014, three days after the aircraft disappeared, the British satellite company in Marsat had provided officials with data suggesting that the aircraft was nowhere near the seas in the Gulf of Thailand and the South China Sea, which were being searched at the time, and that it may have diverted its course through a southern or northern corridor. This information was not acknowledged publicly until it was released by the Malaysian Prime Minister in a press conference on the 15th of March, um, explaining why information about the satellite signal had not been made available earlier. Uh, the Malaysian airline stated that the raw satellite signals needed to be verified and analysed, quote, so that their significance could be properly understood, end quote before it could publicly confirm their existence. Um, Mr. Hussein claimed that Malaysian and US investigators had immediately discussed the Inmarsat um, data upon receiving it on the 12th of March, and that they had agreed to send the data to the US for further processing on two separate occasions. Um, data analysis was completed on the 14th of March. In June 2014, relatives of passengers on Flight 370 began a crowdfunding campaign to raise 100,000 US dollars, with the ultimate goal of trying to raise 5 million US dollars as a reward to encourage anyone with any knowledge of the location of MH370 or what caused its disappearance to reveal what they knew. So they thought that someone knew something and they were trying to raise some money so that someone would come forward with information. The campaign ended on the 8th of August 2014 after raising 100,516 US dollars from 1,007 contributors. Um, lack of evidence in determining the cause of Flight 370's disappearance as well as the absence of any physical confirmation that the plane crashed raised many issues regarding payments made by insurance agencies. So because they had no proof that it actually crashed, they didn't have like the plane, they had some debris, but that didn't come until like 2015, 2016. So they had no idea what happened to this plane. Um, so it was hard for the insurance companies to determine what they were gonna pay and what for, basically. Under the Montreal Convention, which is a multilateral treaty, it is the carrier's responsibility to prove lack of fault in an accident, and each passenger's next of kin automatically entitled, regardless of fault, to a payment of approximately $175,000 from the airline's insurance company, which would amount to a cost of 40 million US dollars for the 227 passengers that were on board. Soon after the disappearance of Flight 370, Malaysia Airlines offered condolence payments to families um, of the passengers. In China, the families were offered around 31,000 yen, which is approximately 5,000 US dollars, and this was comfort money, um, but some rejected the offer. It's also reported that Malaysian relatives received only $2,000, so for, they could get like 175,000 and they were being offered like 5,000 or 2,000 in some cases, which is so bad. In June 2014, um, Malaysia's Deputy Foreign Minister Hamza Zanuddin said that families of seven passengers received 50,000 advance compensation from Malaysia Airlines. Full payment would come after the aircraft was found or officially declared lost, which later occurred in January 2015. The aircraft manufactured um, after 2020, cockpit voice recorders will be required to record at least 25 hours of data to ensure that all phases of the flights are recorded. Um, aircraft designs approved after 2020 will need to incorporate a way of recovering the flight recorders or the information contained on them um, before the recorder sinks below the water. So anything made after this year will need to have something on it so that we can basically find out what happened if there is another crash. However, the new regulations do not require modifications to be made to existing aircrafts. So if you're on a plane that was made before 2020 your plane doesn't need any of this new stuff on which is kind of weird that it's just like this year that they've decided that it needs all that stuff 
So what do you think? I think it's weird that a huge plane can basically just disappear into thin air with no like, there wasn't really any like proper debris. Like there was some that washed up a few years later, but not the whole plane. I just feel like that's so odd. And like, there was a lot of suspicious stuff going on like with the pilots flight simulator and things. And then those men that had like the fake passport. So I don't know, maybe it was something to do with them. Who knows? We'll never know. But stuff like this is just really fascinates me that I like, will never get the answers. I don't know if that's weird because <laughs> like most people like things that have been solved. But I just like unsolved stuff is just so interesting to me because it's like anything could have happened and we'll never know. And there's so many theories um about like what might have gone down. Like to me that's just so much more interesting than things getting solved. So that's what we're gonna be doing pretty much every week. Um It'll be more like missing person cases next time rather than like a great big plane disappearing. But I just thought I'd start off with something like well known um, that there's a lot of information on and then gradually we'll get into like all sorts of different cases. Um, there's a few coming up that are like totally different from each other and from this one. So that's going to be really exciting. So yeah, this is basically what I'm going to be doing every Monday, just sitting down and doing my makeup and talking about a missing persons case that's that I found and that interests me so that's what's going to be happening now every week so comment down below if there's anything that you've seen that you think i might want to talk about any like missing cases that you know of where you are that haven't been discussed if there's any missing person cases that you've heard of that really interest you then comment the name of said person below and i can research that and we can get that in a video but yeah i've had quite a lot of fun just sitting down and doing my makeup and like talking about something that's interesting to me rather than doing like a tutorial um i found it a lot more like relaxing because it's something that i'm interested in so i can just talk about it forever <laughs> so this is definitely going to be lots of fun for me to do and i won't feel like as nervous on camera because it's something that i like talking about hope you like the finished look i didn't really speak through it because it was quite a difficult one for me to do on camera and talk um but yeah every monday it will just be it won't be like tutorial so anything i've used i'll pop in the description box below if you want to recreate so i'll see you guys in the next video bye